Thanks, Rachel, for pulling all of this together. My name is Lynn Shibley, and I represent Artworks, and um, really grateful for all the work that uh, Dr. Falk does for the arts, not only in our community, but in so many other communities. And she's a master at doing these Zoom presentations now. She's done quite a few for us. And our theme for our event this week is Mission Possible. And so with that thought, um, she had been working on the Monument Men and what they were doing. So we thought we would integrate those components and then she invited her class to join us. So I'm really excited to see all these, well, I don't see all the faces, but to see all these names out here and to see this kind of participation, I think that's fantastic. So for all the students, know that you're always welcome at Artworks in downtown Big Rapids. And we'd love to see you stop by sometime and check us out. We've got lots of programs going all the time and lots of beautiful art by Michigan artists. So we welcome you anytime. So thank you again for everybody being here. And Rachel, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, can everybody hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up or a nod? Okay, if that changes, uh, let me know. Because <laughs> otherwise I'll just be chatting away. Um, Thank you all for coming, for um, being a, a great audience today. Thank you, Lynn, um, for inviting me to participate in the Artworks Gala. Um, you know, we had hoped to get together in person, but um, I think all of the virtual events that um, Lynn uh, as outgoing director, right? And Matt as the new director and Denise and all of the folks at Artworks are doing it's just been a really cool week with stuff on Facebook and stuff on Zoom and things in person and that gala to go box is awesome. No, oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I uh, mentioned though that people may not know you are on the Artworks board. So yes. you're one of our wonderful board members. So Yes. Um, so I, I joined the Artworks board in January. Um, and I think most of you know I'm also a professor of art history at Ferris State University. Thank you all for being here. Thanks also to all the sponsors um, of the Artworks Gala. And because we're talking about um, World War II and soldiers and people that fought in the war effort, um, I also wanna take a minute to acknowledge and thank any veterans that we have in our audience. I know at least one of my students is a veteran. And so I wanna thank y'all for your service um, as you know, part of, um, a part of what I'm presenting today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I think the, whoever the host is, is that you, Lynn? You have to give me permission or Denise, maybe give me permission to share my screen. That would be Denise. Okay. I'm working on it, hang on. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> they don't let me be in charge of any anything that's technical at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh. All right, try now. Okay. Yeah, I think I can do it. All right, do y'all see my screen? It's coming up. Okay. Yep. There we go. Excellent. So um, the title of today's lecture is The Monuments Men and the Mission to Save Art During World War II. Um, and Lynn and I kind of brainstormed about something art historical that we could also relate to the Mission Possible or the Mission Still Possible um, Artworks Virtual Gala. Um, so you may know a bit about the Monuments Men. Um, they've been in popular history and popular culture relatively recently. Um, I think a, a big contributor to our knowledge and sort of bringing them in, into more popular knowledge is the book you see on the left entitled The Monuments Men, it was written by Robert M. Edsel and um, originally published in 2009. Um, it's a really interesting book, long book. It has a lot of uh, primary sources in it. And as Robert Edsel writes in that book, it relies on scholarship of many, many other scholars who have been um, interviewing the Monuments Men um, and going through primary source documents and that sort of thing. You may also have seen the movie, The Monuments Men, which came out in 2014, um, directed by George Clooney. And as you look at the uh, DVD case there, you can see starring a lot of um, 
pretty well-known actors, um, you know, in, in uh, the movie business today. Um, so who were the Monuments Men? What was their mission? I wanna say first, they were actually Monuments Men and women. Uh, it's usually the men that get the most credit because um, they, more of them participated and more were uh, on the front lines, but there certainly were women involved with this effort as well. Their full name, the full name of this group was the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Program. And it's often um, abbreviated with its initials. And it was established in 1943 um, to protect cultural property in areas that were being um, impacted by World War II. I think it's important to emphasize while many of the Monuments Men um, did join the army and go through uh, boot camp and become soldiers, trained soldiers, before they did that, they were art professionals. Um, they were artists, they were architects, they were art historians, they were art conservators, um, and they were museum curators. Um, so they brought an understanding and care for art and culture to their military service. And you know, bringing these two things together, um, the, the knowledge of the art and the art history, um, as well as military training, um, I think is what allowed so much of their mission to be successful. Actually, a number of these art professionals, even before the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives program was established, number of art professionals had become concerned as World War II advanced in Europe, um, in particular the American Council of Learned Societies and also the American Defense Harvard Group um, had been working with um, the US Army and the US government to identify and protect buildings and monuments and art uh, from harm uh, during the fighting and also from Nazi plundering. Um, I think one of the more well-known examples of um, the work of the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives program um, was how they had to help uh, allied forces um, especially those that were dropping bombs. Um, they had to help them be very strategic um, in the way that they dropped those bombs. Um, for instance, when uh, the Allied forces advanced through Italy and finally got to Florence, um, you know, this was Nazi held uh, at the time. And um, they had to be very strategic and hit very specifically the train station in Florence while missing the Florence Cathedral and the many other churches in Florence. And, you know, the people that gave the, you know, of course the pilots have great knowledge and precision um, in their work, but they were advised by those historians um, who were saying, you know, hit this specifically, don't hit that, miss that. And, you know, there was a whole um, list of priorities that they had to come up with. And, you know, this was important for a couple of different reasons. I think um, first and foremost, most uh, people wanted to protect cultural property. I mean, at this, this kind of made sense to people, um, but, it was uh, the, just, the accidental destruction of cultural property was actually being used in the propaganda campaigns of the Nazis. When the Americans actually did hit um, an Italian monastery um, out of necessity to, to they thought, save uh, some of their soldiers. Um, when they hit that monastery in Monte Cassino, which is in Northern Italy, um, the Nazis really seized upon that and said, look, uh, you know, these allies, these Americans, these British, um, they're no better than barbarians. Um, so, you know, there were strategic, many strategic reasons as well as cultural reasons um, that um, these professionals went to work. We also, um, I, I wanna introduce some of the figures to you. I, I can't uh, do all of that today in, um, in the interest of time, but I thought for those of you that have seen the movie um, or read the book or just know a bit about the history, um, I wanted to introduce some of the, maybe the better known um, leaders um, of the Monuments Men. Um, the first being Lieutenant George L. Stout. You can see him on the left and 
the character in the movie that's played by George Clooney, he takes a new name, uh, but he's very similar to this character. Um, and, and in the movie, his name is Frank Stokes. Um, also, um, Second Lieutenant uh, James R. Rorimer, you see him on the left. Um, he uh, was in the US 7th Army. He was also curator of medieval art at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So imagine going from curating um, in the quietude of a museum or being a conservator and professor um, as George Stout was, um, and then joining the army, going through training, etc. cetera. Um, he is sort of fictionalized in the movie, um, plays a character named Jay, or excuse me, as, as a character named James Granger and is played by Matt Damon. Another uh, person who we definitely have to acknowledge and I think get to know um, is Rose Valland. Uh, she was a French woman um, and she worked at the Jus de Pomme Museum in Paris. Um, and she's played, or a character sort of based on her by the name of Claire Simone is played by Kate Blanchett um, in the movie, if you've seen that movie. Um, a note about the movie, they take some liberties to be sure, uh, you know, not all, and, and you know, any work of art, any, you know, movie is allowed to do this and, and sort of um, expand upon and change the story. And they, they certainly do that in the movie. Um, and they, they sort of combine some actual historical figures into singular characters and that kind of thing. Um, but I thought, because I know some of you have seen the movie, it would be worth um, introducing both the historical figure um, and um, the character from the movie. Um, Rose Valland was a very important source of information during World War II. Um, so working in Paris as a curator at that museum, um, understand of course that France was was occupied during World War II, occupied by the Nazis, and the Nazis were using that particular museum, the Jus de Pomme, um, as a storage house for the art that they were looting. And most of the art that the Nazis were looting in France, they were taking from private families, uh, in particular Jewish families. Um, so when those people fled the country to save themselves, or if they were sent to concentration camps, um, laws were enacted that said they were no longer citizens and that meant their property could be stolen. Their, if their property, and actually they wouldn't have called it stolen. The Nazis called it, you know, just confiscated. Those are no longer citizens. We're gonna take their belongings. And some of the belongings that uh, the Nazis coveted the most were works of art um, that belonged to private families. Well, Rose Valland, you know, continued to work at the museum. She had to do that, um, but she also kept records. She would take mental notes during the day at work as um, uh, things were brought into the museum. Um, she would keep official catalogs for the Nazis, uh, but she would go home and she kept private catalogs and kept a record of where everything was going and where it was being stored and who was taking it and you know what train it ended up on. Um, and these records ended up being so, so valuable um, to the allies and um, actually ended up helping getting some of these pieces back. I think we have to pause and think about Nazi plunder, Nazi looting, of works of art, both you know, big works of art in um, public context, uh, but also those works of art that the Nazis were taking from private families. We have to put that in, into context and consider Adolf Hitler's relationship with art. Um, he actually was an artist. Um, he wanted to go to art school. He wanted to make his career as a professional artist. Um, you're actually looking at one of his paintings here, watercolor. Um, and he applied to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts twice um, in his home country of Austria, um, applied in 1907 and 1908 to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. And both times he was rejected. Um, you know, his work was not deemed good enough um, by uh, the professors and the jurors that um, you know, were accepting only um, a select number of artists every year. Um, and 
I think we really have to keep that in our minds that sometimes is lost in the, the larger study of World War II um, because it, it ends up putting him on a very different path. Um, in terms of what Hitler liked, um, his style was very traditional. I think you can see that by looking at this landscape or this um, image of the courtyard here. He was influenced by the old European masters um, and he really preferred painting architecture and he rejected what we would call modernism. So he was not interested in abstraction. Um, he wanted everything to be a naturalistic, realistic representation of the world around him. Um, and as he rose to power in the Nazi party, he used art and his interpretation of art for political purposes. Um, so by 1937, um, he mounted a show of what he called degenerate art, and that's actually written in German across the building here, uh, mounted that show in Munich. And this is all of the art that he didn't like, the style that he didn't like, uh, modernism, abstraction, um, you know, the art that um, I study with students in my 20th century art class as being really innovative and different and new, um, Hitler really did not like. And so he set up this whole spectacle and you can see how many people showed up, right? As you look at the lines outside um, and, you know, there are um, sort of bad sayings, um, you know, written above it. Um, notice how it's all very crowded together, like you can't actually appreciate any single piece. Um, that's very purposeful, um, putting this stuff up with in cramped spaces and with disparaging remarks. Um, he means for people to look down upon this. Um, he also, um, he associated um, Jewish artists, Jewish people uh, with modernism and with abstraction and that was another layer of his disdain uh, for this art. Um, so for him, this was a way of rejecting new ideas. And what he wanted to do instead was rebuild his um, hometown of Linz, Austria. You're looking at a, a model for how he wanted to rebuild Linz, Austria. You can see that at the top. Um, he wanted to rebuild that city as a cultural center of the old style. And you can, I think you can start to see that in the models, but you can really see it in this museum that he planned to have built. It's very classical. You can see the columns and the pilasters. Um, and it was, this was going to be the Fuhrer Museum, um, and it was only going to display traditional old master art, um, in particular promoting Germanic culture. Um, and, you know, he considered this part of his mission of an ethnic cleansing of Europe. He wanted to um, promote what he considered acceptable and destroy what he did not consider acceptable. Um, his plunder of Europe um, was systematic. Um, I think we can see this um, in studying the history of the Holocaust and the way in which um, Jewish people and other marginalized groups uh, were shipped to concentration camps. And his plunder was also systematic in the way that he went after public churches and museums, as well as private collections. Um, he actually hired uh, curators um, and um, art historians in Germany and in Austria, and he had them using their skills, their professional skills, um, to make lists for him of what art he was gonna find in every city, and this was part of his invasion um, as he, you know, sort of swept across Europe in Poland and, and uh, et cetera. You know, it was not only, um, you know, destroy the communities there and destroy the people, uh, but also take the art that, 
you know, was considered traditional and acceptable destroy the other works. Um, and I sort of pause and reflect upon that. Um, you know, these professionals, these professional historians and art historians and curators were along for that ride. They did that work. Um, and, and one of the things that I've read recently um, in, in a book that's about um, fighting back against tyranny, um, a scholar by the name of uh, Timothy Snyder says, you always have to protect the ethics of your profession. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that means policemen and that means doctors, you know, doing what is right. We think about those, um, those professions as, as having to have a code of ethics, but really that applies to all professions. All of these art professions can be used for bad things. So two works of art um, form important uh, parts of the narrative of the Monuments mo Men movie um, and also the Monuments Men book. And these works of art were certainly destined for the Fuhrer Museum. I should mention that while the collecting for the Fuhrer Museum started, um, it was never built, it was never realized. Um, but this art had already been um, started to be looted, stolen, taken, what have you. Um, the work that I'm going to begin with is a very large painting that we've also been studying in my Art History 111 class. Um, it's known as the Ghent Altarpiece. Um, this is a massive uh, multi-paneled altarpiece um, that was set up at the Church of St. Bavo in Ghent. And um, this is what the altarpiece looks like closed. Um, and I am borrowing some photos from my good friends who I think are here, uh, Joanna Meyer and John Scott Gray. Uh, they took some great photos. I did not get good photos like this um, of a copy of the Ghent altarpiece. Um, there's a copy in the church of St. Bavo in Ghent. Um, the original is back in this church today, um, but it's in a small little darkened room and behind glass and there's no photos allowed in there. So these are professional photos that the museum has provided. This is um, a copy so that you can sort of see it in the church space. And here's what it looks like open. Um, and this is a really good picture because it helps us appreciate the scale. Um, this, this is very large, large scale. And we actually know a bit about the history of, of how this was created. Um, it's painted by the Van Eyck brothers, um, Hubert and Jan Van Eyck. Um, they're often credited as being the inventors of oil painting. So when you think about you know, the medium of oil painting, when that linseed oil is mixed with pigments and it allows artists to um, layer their paint very slowly over time, this is a Flemish invention. It's invented in Flanders. We would call that Belgium today. Um, and Jan van Eyck often gets credit for inventing it. Although I have told my students to take that with a grain of salt because other painters were doing that around the same time too. Um, I think what we can say though is, is Hubert and Jan van Eyck really perfected oil painting um, and, and, and took it to its height uh, very early in its history. So when the doors are closed, what do we see here? Well, these are actually the two patrons, the figures that are kneeling and have their hands in prayer. We know their names. They are Jodicus Vide and his wife, Elizabeth Borlut. And so they paid for this work. They commissioned this work to show their piety um, to God, show their uh, reverence for their city as well, putting this in um, you know, a public context in Ghent. Um, so, and this is common at the time to see the patron actually feature in the work of art, to show them as sort of pious and holy. They're kneeling before what looks like a statue, but of course this is painted, uh, the wonderful skill of the Van Eyck brothers. This is John the Baptist, and this is the disciple John. The disciple John is usually shown younger and clean shaven, John the Baptist usually has a long beard and he wears sort of an animal skin tunic uh, because he lived in the wilderness. What we see up here um, is a very common scene in Catholic Christian art, and that is Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel, holding some white lilies 
and he has approached the Virgin Mary to tell her, to announce to her that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. Um, and notice that this takes place in a room where you can look out a window and it doesn't look to me like first century in the Holy Land. In fact, it looks a lot like Ghent. Um, this has been sort of modernized for the time, uh, made contemporary uh, to make it relatable to those viewers that would be looking at it in the 1400s to make something from the past seem um, really contemporary and relatable. Now, when we open it up, it is really grand. Um, when we open it up, we have a celestial assembly up here, a heavenly assembly, as well as an earthly assembly um, at the bottom. So at the bottom, it's actually a landscape that goes across all five panels. Um, and this is the revelation of the Lamb of God. Um, and so the Lamb of God, which of course is, is used as a way to describe Jesus, the Agnes Day, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice um, on the altar. And he is surrounded by um, saints and um, all of those that gather and pray before him. We've got angels, apostles, popes, theologians, martyrs, knights, and judges um, all surrounding this miraculous event. Above, um, we have an image of God, God the Father, Mary being crowned in heaven, John the Baptist over here, angels, choirs of angels singing, and then you've probably um, figured out that we're looking at Adam and Eve there, um, first man and first woman, according to um, Judeo-Christian theology. Um, this was a very well-loved painting from the very beginning. Um, it, it, it became famous in its own time. Um, and I want to just read to you from a source um, written in the 1500s, uh, Carol Van Mander. He talks about the altar painting of the Van Eyck brothers was shown only to a few personages of high standing or to someone who would reward the keeper very well. And what he's talking about there is it was only opened if you rewarded the keeper, if you paid the keeper a little bit. Most days it was closed. It was only on festival days or if you made a payment to the keeper that you could see it. Sometimes it was shown on important holidays, but then there was usually such a crowd that it was difficult to come near it. Then the chapel containing the altarpiece would be filled with all kinds of people, painters young and old, every kind of art lover, swarming like bees and flies around a basket of figs or raisins. So this object became famous in its own time. Um, like I said, it's made of this new medium, people trying to understand um, the great abilities of oil painting and certainly being uh, mesmerized by everything that's happening in the painting, in the altarpiece. It's a much desired object. Um, not only was it famous in its own time, um, in the early 1800s, some of the panels were purchased by a British art collector and they were brought um, to the King of Prussia Frederick William III and kept in Germany. During World War I, more panels were stolen and taken from Ghent to Germany. And at the end of World War I, as part of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany returned those pilfered panels along with the, a few originals that had been legitimately bought to help compensate for what were called German acts of destruction during the war. So this ends up then being taken again by the Nazis in World War II, um, you know, with the idea that this would be placed in that Führer Museum. So, you know, this, this altarpiece suffered a lot of, um, you know, between travel, between being stolen, et cetera. And because of that, um, because of the fact that it was stolen and it was, when it was stolen, it was kept in a salt mine for a period of time to hide it. Um, it has suffered some damage. Um, it has also suffered, suffered damage um, with well-meaning conservation that was done poorly. Um, oftentimes, you know, um, 
people try to restore paintings um, and end up just adding more varnish over the top to give it a shine. And over time, that varnish um, can start to yellow um, and, and sort of damage the painting. Um, so there's actually ongoing um, restoration of this piece in the Ghent Museum of Fine Art. Um, Joanna Meyer and John Scott Gray provided these photos for me. Um, we were actually able to um, take some students on a study abroad a few years ago um, and see this restoration work um, in progress. And um, like I said, this is ongoing. And I think one of the cool things that they're doing um, at this museum is they're making that restoration po process public. Um, oftentimes these things happen in labs sort of out of view, but you can see this is part of the museum display. Um, and the stuff is, um, you know, the, the stuff is there and the work uh, happens um, in front of the public. Um, in fact, when we were there on our study abroad a couple of years ago, we saw a woman working with, you know, the tiniest of Q-tips. She was dipping it in a solvent um, and then rubbing away just sort of stroke by stroke um, some of that older varnish. Um, and one of my students, uh, Megan, um, actually <laughs> found, found the person when she was on her break, uh, found the conservator when she was on her break, walking around the museum and, you know, confirmed that that's indeed what she was doing. I mean, that's what we thought, but, you know, and she got a few more details um, from the art restorer. Um, so this is a, a very slow process, a very methodical process, if it's done well. And I just wanted to show you um, what part of the restoration has recently revealed. Um, and this is the lamb that's at the center. The whole thing sort of revolves around the mystic revelation of the lamb, seeing the lamb of God, which is, of course, um, a metaphor, a symbol for Jesus. This is the old version. This is what they found as they very slowly not only took off varnish, but took off overpainting that later restorers had done in what I think is a pretty aggressive mispainting of this work. So notice here, you can see the lamb's face, you see the eyes. These are the original ears down here. You can see that one a little bit better. But whoever restored this at some point in the last few centuries gave it a new set of ears. And the restorers have found, you know, through uh, different I mean, technologies, x-rays, that sort of thing, um, they found that this is actually the original. And they removed those ears, took us back to the original ears. Um, the eyes actually faced a little bit more forward. Um, and some people have commented this is disturbing. What the original to some people's eye, to some people's taste, is a little bit disturbing. Uh, it almost looks sort of human-like, right? How it, um, it engages our gaze. But I think the Van Eyck brothers are doing that on purpose because this is not any lamb. This is the lamb of God, uh, which is a symbol for Jesus. And so they're, I believe, and you know, scholars that have studied this uh, in, in more depth believe that this is purposeful. This is part of the iconography that the Van Eyck brothers um, were participating in and even creating uh, to make this lamb of God uh, almost human-like um, to, to sort of bring about an image that would remind people of Jesus. Um, and when I look at back at this and see the four ears, that's what I find disturbing now. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we have to be okay with the work of those professionals that very scientifically and historically um, uh, did that restoration. So this much um, desired object, um, it does quite a lot. We could talk about its iconography further. Um, but in the context of the discussion today, you know, why did Hitler, why did the Nazis want this piece in particular? Um, because it was one of those first oil paintings, because it was so well known from its very beginning. And they also, you know, even though this was actually created in Flanders, um, they sort of created a, a Germanic backstory to this piece. So they thought this would be um, appropriate for the Fear Museum. 
very shortly, I'm going to show you where this was recovered, where it was found by the Monuments Men. Um, but another piece I want to show you today uh, is another piece that was stolen. Um, this from Bruges, known as the Bruges Madonna, um, the uh, work of Michelangelo. And it was carved between 1501 and 1504. And like I said, this also features um, in the Monuments Men book and in the movie, and for good reason. Um, you know, Michelangelo is, is one of the great sculptors of, um, of European art, of European history. Um, Hitler admired him. Hitler actually did not uh, visit Italy uh, until he was leader of the Nazi party. Um, and he became enamored uh, with the David and the Pietà and you know, other statues that he saw in Italy. Um, so he uh, and his advisors stole this piece from Bruges. Um, and interestingly enough, this is one of, um, the only one, I should say, not the one, not one of, but the only one of Michelangelo's sculptures that actually ever left Italy during Michelangelo's time. Um, it was bought by a Flemish family, the Muscron family, and installed in Bruges. So it had been in Bruges for a long time by the time uh, it was stolen by the Nazis. Um, that being said, this also has a history as a desired object. Uh, it was also stolen by Napoleon and his armies when they rolled through Europe. Um, art has for a long time, I think, been associated with um, political power and uh, with empire or, you know, sort of would-be empire making. Um, and so this is stolen again by the Nazis for the Fuhrer Museum um, and it was hidden in a mine. I'll show you uh, some pictures of that shortly. But I want to stop and sort of think about, you know, what makes this work of art an accomplishment? Um, in part, I think it's, it's that it's the innovation in composition. Um, Mary here has an active child. Um, if you're used to looking at Madonna and child images, often the baby sort of sits very comfortably on Mary's lap. Um, sometimes the baby almost looks like a little miniature man and he holds up his hands and uh, fingers and blesses us, the viewer. This is a slightly older baby. In fact, I'd call this a toddler um, and he's active. We're seeing um, baby Jesus as a real live active child as opposed to a baby in Mary's arms. I think that's part of the appeal of this piece. Um, if you're familiar with Michelangelo's work and, and my students, I think we'll be looking at this next week. Um, this is a, probably a better known sculpture by Michelangelo. This helps to establish Michelangelo's prominence in Italy. Um, the Pietà, which shows Mary and uh, her son in her lap again, but this is um, Jesus after he's been taken down from the cross. Um, it's a life-size sculpture. It's a, a very moving sculpture where, you know, we're asked to contemplate and feel piety and feel pity uh, for Mary um, with the dead Jesus on her lap. And if we compare the faces, this is the Pietà done a little bit earlier um, and the Bruges Madonna done a little bit later. I think you can see some similarities there in how Michelangelo imagines Mary, uh, calm, youthful, uh, looking down and, you know, she's looking down and, and sort of making her peace with the death of her son here. When I see this, I see Michelangelo really trying to get us to think about the fact that maybe she already knows uh, at some level uh, what will become of her son. There's something quite contemplative about this piece. Um, Back to the baby, it's the baby that um, I think really makes this piece. And I just wanna show you a picture that my friend John took while I um, got to see this for the first time. And I was kind of overwhelmed at seeing this piece and um, he, he captured that. Um, I've been taking a lot of pictures here and that's my overwhelmed face at seeing the Bruges Madonna. And today you can see she's actually behind glass uh, to, to protect her um, today. And, there, and there's some uh, security measures there. But the baby, I think, is what makes this piece. Um, and the relationship between the mother and the son, uh, you know, that he sort of grasps the knee and you see the hand um, press into the drapery and into the knee of Mary. You see them 
um, holding hands there. He looks down too, but there's such a sweetness and it's like he's almost going to slide off of her lap, but he knows that he is protected there, right? Um, as, he, as he stands and looks down. And this is something that I think Michelangelo just does really well. Um, he does the same thing in painting. His Jesuses, his baby Jesuses look like babies. So many baby Jesuses don't. Um, and you know, this is um, a Holy Family painting that Michelangelo did. And I know my parents are watching and I know this is like a shared favorite of my family's um, in the Uffizi Gallery. And again, that baby's a real baby and that's a real family. You can tell Michelangelo has studied, you know, how a mom and a dad pass a kid between uh, each other. Look at how the baby here is playing with the mom's hair, right? Um, so yes, it's an image of the holy family, of the divine, uh, but it's also a family. And Michelangelo, I think, really has um, a, a real vision and skill for helping us to see that both in the Bruges Madonna and in the Holy Family. So this was recovered um, in a salt mine in Austria in 1945. Um, and so you can see um, it's being taken out, sort of wrapped up and, um, by the monuments men in, um, in, in cloth and, and with pillows and, and what have you to protect it. Um, you can see a sort of makeshift uh, support for it. Um, this was hidden in that mine in Austria um, because the Germans wanted it ev eventually to end up in, um, in that museum in Lenz, in the Führer Museum. But that, of course, that, um, that museum never got built. And by 1945, um, things are getting, um, you know, the, the war is almost over. Um, but that actually didn't end the monuments men's work. In fact, that made their work more difficult. Um, you've, some of you have probably heard of the Nero decree, um, as it's called. This is a decree that, um, that Hitler gave in 1945. Um, he, he and his men w wanted to intentionally destroy things that ha they had stolen. They also intentionally destroyed infrastructure and bridges, et cetera, um, because they knew they were losing the war and they wanted to make uh, things more difficult for the allies. Um, so it was kind of a race against time um, on the part of the monuments men to continue to recover works of art that had been stolen um, so that they didn't just get purposely destroyed. Um, and so you can see the recovery of the Bruges Madonna here found in the salt mine. In the same mine, uh, you see the monuments men here and you see panels of the Ghent altarpiece. That's the lamb that we just looked at with the angels and uh, all of those worshipers around. You can see some of the panels behind the figures. There's Eve, um, there is uh, some of the choir of angels. And I just wanna emphasize, you know, mines are wet and humid. Um, and this is an oil painting on wood. Um, so this is part of the reason uh, it, you know, was so damaged is, you know, that's really bad for wood to have it in, in that level of humidity. Um, but of course it was saved, um, you know, uh, by these uh, monuments, men and women, by their efforts, um, recovered and eventually returned to Ghent. This piece returned to Ghent, the Madonna returned to Bruges, works, you know, returned as best uh, they could. I want to emphasize, though, that um, not everything was could be returned, um, especially uh, works that, of course, had been stolen from Jewish families. Um, so you're looking here at um, the confiscation of Jewish property. This is in Paris in 1941. They're taking the furniture, the bookshelves, um, looks like a mattress here. But of course, they also took the paintings, and we're seeing the paintings from the back here. Uh, we're seeing um, a table of clocks, um, table upon table of uh, dishes and porcelain and, you know, glasses and teacups. And um, I, we also, you know, there were table upon table of, of menorahs and uh, Torah scrolls and the beautiful uh, toppers that go on top of Torah scrolls. And 
efforts were made to return this stuff to rightful owners, but of course many of those owners had died, had died at the hands of the Nazis in concentration camps. And it's worth uh, considering that each of these objects belong to a person, belong to a family, um, is, is a whole series of memories. And we can't forget that as we talk about these great works uh, that maybe these better works that are known um, from churches and museums from public contexts. Look at all the private art that was stolen. Look at all the, the private memories that were taken. Um, and I, I think it's important to think of these as um, being associated with actual people. Uh, six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Um, this was systematic, killing them and also taking their things. Some of the art uh, that was stolen still has not been recovered. Um, I'm showing you one example that was taken uh, from the Czartoryski Museum in Krakow, Poland. This museum was started and run by um, a well-to-do family in Krakow, um, and they stole um, 800 plus works of art from this museum, and they are still missing. Um, and one of the better known pieces from that museum that was stolen is this portrait of a young man um, by Raphael. And work actually still goes on today. They've, they've, uh, scholars in Poland have made a database of missing works of art. They try to get images of these missing works of art out there uh, because once in a while something will show up in auction. Um, and oftentimes somebody doesn't know that they have a looted work of art. Even museums have sometimes bought works um, in, you know, what appear to be, you know, uh, totally reasonable and lawful auctions. Um, but the history of the work is not well known going back. Um, and, and, you know, it's happened recently that, that museums have given works of art back to um, the descendants of the original owners of works of art. Um, and this work still goes on. Um, and so, you know, we wonder, is this work, um, was it purposely stolen? Um, excuse me, was it purposely destroyed um, as uh, the Nazis um, knew they were losing? Um, or is this possibly in somebody's, um, you know, private home? Uh, will it show up at some point on the black market or in an auction? Um, you know, I think more and more works of, of art still continue um, to, to be found again. And of course, now we're talking about um, maybe the grandchildren of, um, of the original owners that might be able to claim uh, these works of art today. I wanna take you now to Italy, um, just to consider um, a little bit more about the Monuments Men. Um, and I'm taking you to Pisa in particular, um, you can see the Cathedral of Pisa. It looks very large here, the baptistry. That's partly because of the perspective of this photo. Uh, you can see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And then over here, you just see um, a little bit of a very large building known as the Campo Santo. Um, I don't think the Campo Santo is nearly as well known as the tower, um, but it should be. It should be. Uh, the Campo Santo in Italy um, is a medieval monument. Um, it's built in the Gothic style. Um, you can see the pointed windows, uh, the arches that almost come to a point. You can see the beautiful tracery. Uh, and Campo Santo essentially means sacred field, sacred field. Um, and actually inside the courtyard of this sacred field um, is some dirt uh, from the Holy Land that was brought back um, to Pisa in the Middle Ages to sanctify this space. And so we have this beautiful courtyard. And then this painting, I think, helps us appreciate what this once looked like. Um, it's a wonderful um, a cloister where um, originally there were beautiful frescoes and we also have sculptures, but we also have two monuments, two monuments, including ancient Roman sarcophagi. Pisa actually uh, was a, a Roman outpost. Um, so there are Roman ruins in Pisa. 
um, but also buried in the floor are the great, uh, and they're mostly men, um, but the great men and women of um, Italy and particularly of Pisa. Uh, this is essentially sort of a, um, a, a graveyard um, for the illustrious people of Pisa. This is what it looks like today, but it's been rebuilt. This is what it looked like uh, near the end of World War II. Um, and this was actually hit by allied bombs. Uh, so not hit by the Germans, hit by the allies. Um, and it caught the roof on fire. The um, roof was made of, you can see, of wood. And that caught on fire, uh, not unlike um, the burning of Notre Dame Cathedral. It just took off like a tinderbox. You probably saw that on the news a few years ago. And what that ended up doing was melting a whole bunch of the frescoes off of the wall. Um, so as much as the Monuments Men tried uh, to protect cultural property in Europe, and as much as the Monuments Men, you know, saved works of art like the Ghent altarpiece and um, like the Bruges Madonna, here's an example where we have great destruction. But the story doesn't end there. This man, another Monuments Man, Dean Keller, he was a painter. He worked at Yale School of Fine Arts. Uh, here he is helping to recover a sculpture um, during his time in Europe. Um, as a member of the MFAA, he was stationed in Italy and he actually began the efforts to restore the frescoes. So they're not in great shape today, but parts have been restored on the original walls. The building has been rebuilt um, and the, the restoration is actually ongoing. It's still happening today piecing together little bits of fresco that they found in pieces on the floor, comparing that with paintings that show what this originally looked like and sketches and drawings of what this originally looked like, uh, the restoration continues. So this work really isn't done yet. Um, and something that really moved me uh, when I and you can see here some of the restoration, it actually doesn't look so bad there, right? Um, you know, it, it's, for the loss that it could have been, um, some of it is, is, um, was saved and some of it has been uh, restored. And like I said, is in the process of being restored. Um, you can see some of the sculptures, that's an ancient Roman sarcophagus. It's just this great space. Um, but, and it's, you know, this place of, of, of sacredness, of sanctity, of solemnity, you sort of walk through and the light hits you. And, and you contemplate all the history that this place has seen, um, all of the people that were buried here, going back to Roman times, now they weren't actually buried in the ground, but there are their sarcophagi, right? Uh, there, uh, the people that were buried um, in the graves in the floor. And the thing that moved me the most uh, in visiting this on a different study abroad trip when we were in Italy, um, Dean Keller was actually buried here in 1992. Um, so he was so well loved by the people of Pisa. He's actually the only non-Italian to be buried in this space. Um, they call him Dean Keller. They give us his dates. Um, they call him simply Painter here. Um, this is an Italian and it talks about, um, you know, what he did uh, in, uh, when he was stationed here in the army. Um, that he, you know, helped to rebuild this Campo Santo. Um, and then he returned uh, to this space and was buried here in May of 2000. And they've, they've used Latin here. They're getting, uh, you know, really ancient in their phrasing. And it says, essentially, our dear friend has returned to his friends, uh, which I think is really touching. Our dear friend has returned to his friends. Um, so being honored in modern Pisa uh, for the work that he did beginning uh, in, in uh, the war itself um, and starting that project to rebuild the Campo Santo, um, like I said, the only non-American um, honored with burial in this space. Um, so I want to step back uh, by way of conclusion and, and think about art and why it matters and um, you know why these men and women put their lives on the line um, to, to 
uh, restore works of art to save works of art. And I'm going to turn to a quote um, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, that he gave at the dedication of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC in March of 1941. So as the war is, um, well, it's happening. I, I, I don't think America is quite committed to the war at this point, uh, but it's interesting. We see the, a president who ultimately, um, you know, joined the effort. And we can also see that he was committed uh, at some level to preserving art. And so we can kind of see how he was persuaded um, to, to help to form the Monuments Men. He said, whatever these great paintings may have been to men who looked at them a generation back, today they are not only works of art, today they are symbols of the human spirit and of the world of freedom of the human spirit made. To accept this work today is to assert the purpose of the people of America that freedom of the human spirit and human mind, which has produced the world's greatest art and all its science shall not be utterly destroyed. And of course that was, um, you know, that's the words of the president um, at the dedication of that national museum in Washington DC. But certainly that was the work of the monuments men, that was their mission. Um, both those that fought on the ground and recovered those works, also those that were um, in France, in Britain, in the United States. Uh, I think, you know, we have to acknowledge that um, this was a multinational effort um, to save and recover these works of art because they're more than just the stone or the paint um, or the wood. Um, they are, you know, the achievements of, of the human spirit and the human mind. And I hope that, you know, a little bit of that spirit um, is also at Artworks. I feel it when I go there. Um, and I appreciate all of you listening to me today. If you're interested in further reading and viewing, um, I have suggested some books and some films um, and a website. Um, this really just scratches the surface, but it's a nice introduction to uh, the Monuments Men and the larger effort um, to save works of art during World War II. Um, and the Monuments Men Foundation today, um, their mission, of course, is to honor those that protected works of art during World War II, um, but they've also moved to restoration of works of art. And in that way, I think they're, you know, continuing the work of, of the Monuments Men uh, for the present day. And of course, you could also take an art history class with me or with my colleagues at Ferris. Um, if you want to learn more about works of art. Let me check the time. Um, does anybody have any questions? Or thoughts? <laughs> Just a personal observation and looking at the piles of um, dishes and clocks and I don't think I've seen that image before and it just struck me as, you know, to your point about behind all of that are people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how devastating and heartbreaking that, you know, to, to see all of that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We, I think we have to, um, you know, I'm talking about the great works of public art. I mean, that was some of my focus today because I know more about those. Uh, there's more documentation about those. Um, you know, when you have a whole table of um, dishes and porcelain and personal works of art from people's homes, um, we've lost so much. Um, we've lost the individual people. We've lost the memories. We don't have the documents. Um, and that was the goal of Hitler and the Nazis. Um, well, destroy the culture. I mean, that's... That's sort of the, the connection. That's why it's so important to keep sort of that whole conversation going and keep a place like Artworks around so that that culture piece, it's who we are. It's our spirit, our human spirit, like Roosevelt said. So. And, and the piece or the exhibit that y'all had up recently, um, the poems and the writings that were celebrating um, our families and the women of Macosta County and Anna Howard Shaw, but also just the everyday people that we know 
uh, grandmothers and aunts. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a big part of um, why we have museums and galleries and spaces like that. Right. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for Dr. Falk? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Don't worry. <laughs> Many of these faces I'm sure you're going to see again. Yes. So, so if, if you're in Art History 111, um, we're just going to continue our discussion next time. Um, and we had just started talking about the Ghent altarpiece. Um, and they actually read the, uh, the primary source that I quoted from. So it worked perfect uh, to talk about that piece, both as an achievement of art and, you know, this uh, touchstone of art history as this first massive oil painting, uh, but also to talk about it as this coveted and often stolen object and how much damage it suffered. Um, and I, one of the panels actually has never been recovered. Um, one of the side panels from the um, in the landscape with the lamb is uh, is still missing, and uh, they have a, a nice um, facsimile of it in in the uh, altarpiece today. I think there's still some hope that they might find it. Um, you know, people are still looking, um, and maybe it will be found in someone's villa or attic. Uh, but nobody, of course, wants to admit that they have that because that's a very well-known piece and you can't really claim that uh, you didn't know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was there. Yeah. <laughs> I opened the closet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it was fascinating to sort of think about all of those stories and I think, too, the importance of maintaining the integrity of the art that we have today. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and um, really, I feel like I'm back in college again, which I always loved. So, well, thank you. everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's uh, it's only scratching the surface of of what happened in World War II, uh, the larger history of of the war, the loss of life. Um, obviously, I didn't get hardly into military history at all, um, and I'm only scratching the surface of of what the monuments men did. But um, you know, I, I kind of focused on the the works that are extremely well known and we're, we're coveted and almost lost. So, um, like I said, if you're, you know, interested in this history a little bit more, um, I would recommend some of those books for sure. Well, thank you again. Scott Cohen, Ferris professor will join us tomorrow at three o'clock. And, um, he has a, um, a strong passion for the country of Spain. Mm -hmm. um, as well as his background in music. So he's going to be talking to us about um, music in Spain, which is always very interesting. He did a piece of this for us for Festival of the Arts a couple years ago. And um, Spain's work in community music and community um, bands is quite fascinating. So that's tomorrow at three o'clock. And then um, on Friday, we'll also have another Zoom presentation by uh, Tracy Bush, which will wrap up sort of that tribute to the women. Um, and she'll be talking about the 19th Amendment. And um, so I think it's been great for our community to be able to engage in this way, even though we can't be face to face. It's still a fantastic way to, to connect. So thank you again for everybody who showed up today, including the students. And I know you probably that was on your, you know, have to do, but we're grateful to see you. Classes. What classes? It's good to be in class with each one so. of you. <laughs> yeah, so we had, thanks, thank you all for coming. Thanks, I see some former students here. I see uh, some friends and some family, and of course the Artworks family. So um, thank you for showing up. I yeah. appreciate it. Great. And Take if care. you have further questions, send me an email, rachelfolk at ferris.edu. Love to chat with you. Great. Thanks again. Thank Have you, everybody. Day.